There's a go. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Episode 88 of the Mind Heist podcast. Welcome and assalamu alaikum. And Muhammad's wearing a thobe again. <laughs> See, I've realized, right, if I don't wear a thobe, I'm, I mean, the mesh is very far from me. So I don't get to pray in the mesh that often. I pray at home a lot of the time. Uh-huh. Um, if I don't wear a thobe, bro, my son climbs all over me while I'm praying. And bro, you get the you get a t-shirt rising problem, bro. The old days going all over the place. So mm. it's got to be a thobe. You understand mm. it's practicalities. Otherwise, I've got to keep repeating my prayers because no matter how many times I tell him, he just mm. he just refuses, bro. He just jumps on my back. He sees it. Obviously, all kids are like that, and they see it as like a a chance to exercise. <laughs> I thought it would be harder with a thobe because, like, they can just pull the bottom. And it pulls all everything down. But I suppose that no. doesn't da- damage your salah, does it? It just no. it's annoying. Plus, when you go into a sujud, you can you can like trap the bottom of your thobe in your with your feet. You know? ah, ah. your feet are going together anyway, so it's like a tactical sort. You Techers. gotta learn all these things, bro. Techers, yeah, bro. man. These things, bro. Mm. Uh, bro, um, I was gonna ask you. Yeah, d- do you did you ever play football? Like, did you grow up playing football? Uh, play football at school, yeah. And um, yeah, sometimes out of school, used to play a bit of football. Nothing serious, bro. Just messing about with friends and stuff. Didn't, mm. Never took it seriously or anything like that. I wasn't in any teams or anything. Mm. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Used to play a bit of football. I used to play in goal quite a lot. Not because I was bad, but because I had like a few years. I had a few years where I was really good in goal. Mm. Um, I'd either be in goal or I played defence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like defence. Um, I... I played uh, on uh, the school team because they were desperate for someone. <laughs> like I never oh, trained really? with them. I never trained with them, uh, but then they had a tournament. And you know, our school was, how do I say this? You could say we were the underdogs in, in all these kind of sports, right? Uh, I yeah. guess we were a smaller school and from a smaller city and stuff. So it's like, if you had 11 players to play, like that was good, you know? Yeah, so yeah. so w- at one point they didn't have enough players. So they're like, yeah, do you want to come? So I was like, okay. So I, I grew up playing a little bit of football, but I never trained. I never, like, I guess I never tried to be good. It was just very, yeah. just messing about. Um, and now I'm like, I was like maybe 15, 16, playing in an actual tournament in Dubai. And uh, they put me right back or left back, one of them. And uh, yeah, the, the the coach just told me like two rules. Yeah, like, if you're not confident, then just kick it out. And yeah. it, uh, if uh, I can't remember, he says another thing. And I just stuck with that. And I played pretty well, man. It was weird. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, well, I've never trained this, you know. But um, I think what helped me at that level, you know, at like school level, stamina helps a lot. And like being bothered yeah. helps a lot. It makes a big difference. Whereas obviously at the eight, later ages and stuff like, especially if people are training, then everyone's fit. But at this level, um, your stamina helped. And because I used to play rugby, rugby requires so much stamina. So I was quite fit. And um, yeah, I, I enjoyed defense a lot. Uh, even when mm. I was playing rugby, um, eventually I started playing more positions where you need that strategic eye of the field, where the ball is going to go, where they're going to go to. So yeah, that's good. That's It's kind of like the difference between, you know, the the kind of uh, hot-headed, uh, just get angry and fight and jump on someone and, and attack, right? That yeah. type of person versus like the ninja, yeah? It's yeah, like yeah. defense is the ninja thing. It's low key, like no one knows who you are. There's no glory really associated with it. Um, but it's like strategic, it's smart, yeah. it's you know, using this rather than, you know, this. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's got their role to play, bro. That's the thing. Yeah. I noticed Mufti likes these things like, um, you know, like Art of War and stuff. There are a lot of books like that. Well, like strategic thinking books from the past. Mm. I got one uh, because once he said in a video, I think it was a QA, and a okay? So someone asked him a question and then he answered using one of these like kind of proverbs from one of these strategic thinking books. So I just Googled that 
And yeah. uh, then I found the book. It's like 36 <laughs> strategies or 36 stratagems or something like that. So I've got that PDF. I haven't read it actually, but it's like a, you know, old Chinese book. Uh, these, these uh, things are quite good, I think, in terms of strategic thinking. Um, yeah. Yeah, especially team-based things. Yeah, I suppose people don't really have that, the old sort of um, ways of channeling that sort of energy to, to you know, deploy any strategy. You know, it's, yeah. it's not like we were in war zones and stuff, but mm. that's but the closest I, I, I thing think you're going to get. You know, I, I, sometimes I think of these things there, yeah, like, for example, if you've got a YouTube channel which has a good objective, okay? Yeah. So I think, for example, I give a, a real example, like Smile to Jenna. You know Smile to Jenna. Smile to Jenna, what he's done is, I think he's done it quite purposely. He's like become a commentary channel. Like there's a lot of commentary channels out there. But he's become the commentary channel who talks about all these trending topics, all these celebrities and this and that, that all the others talk about. But then, of course, he's bringing the Islamic kind of perspective to it. And by yeah. doing that, I, I don't know if he's trying to get the non-Muslims in as well, but the Muslims, they're seeing <clears throat> the Islamic side of it. And I think it's a really good way of kind of doing da'wah, if you like, to those people who yeah. wouldn't watch a lecture. They wouldn't watch this. So if you're in that position like he is, you've got a YouTube channel, for example, you need to think strategically, right? You need to yeah. play the game. You need to think of, okay, YouTube might like ban that kind of content or they might do this to that. And it, it's, it, you got to think of YouTube growth. You got to think of the algorithm. You got to think of the psychology of someone watching the videos. There's a lot that can go into it if you want to play that game, you know, but most people, like they say, are playing checkers when so other people are playing chess, you know? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. The, there's a lot you can do. I, I've been thinking about this because, was it yesterday or the day before, I started uh, listening to Abu Toba. He did an interview with John Fontaine, okay? Yeah. And I'm telling you, yeah, like everyone listening to this podcast now should just stop listening to this and go listen to that. <laughs> oh, no, um, is it that good, yeah? Yeah, because uh, part two, like, so it looks like there's going to be four parts. Um, I, okay. I only watched part two because that's what was recommended to me. And... Um, Allahu Akbar, like he was talking about his time in the Marines and right. uh, is some next level stuff that he was involved in. And he said, I couldn't really talk about this before because I was in, um, I was in the US before, you know, he was like, uh, he was going in and out of, uh, no, he was in jail. <laughs> What's going on? My son's just broke into the house. Continue. <laughs> um, yeah, so he was in jail for, for four years. And uh, three of them was in solitary confinement. Um, but anyway, the point is, um, he said that, he said, you know those films, um, Born, what's it called? Born, uh, Born, Born Identity and all of that. Yeah, yeah. He said, that was me. Really? That's, yeah, that's what he was doing since the age of 17. He signed up um, to the Marines. And okay. he was doing that stuff, basically. And uh, he is crazy, bro. It's crazy. And, and it made me think of, because he said, they teach us. He said, Marines is different to army, right? He's like, yeah. and I think this is what Sharif was telling us, um, yeah, yeah, episode yeah. 79, like Marines is the cream of the crop, the top of the top. They give you the best training and everything, right? So imagine um, first aid, next level training, hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat, next level, um, using uh, different weaponry, all of that right? You probably yeah. learn to fly, parachute, scuba dive, all of that, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. he said, they train you to be the best. But what that means is that if eventually you want to leave, you, you can't fully leave. They're always watching you. And yeah. if in this case, they got a hint, they got that smell that, okay, this guy's like on this Muslim thing. Um, they didn't like it. And they kept coming here, coming to him, giving him uh, operations to do, uh, even though he, he quit the Marines at that time, but they kept going to him uh, as another unit, like a subunit of the CIA. And, uh, you know, they wanted him to do these jobs. And, and then when finally he said, no, I will not do that. Because he said some of these operations, they were gray areas in terms of haram halal. But he said this specific one, it was definitely haram. So he said, I'm not going to do it. They didn't like that. He said he actually fought with them physically. He fought with them and they just didn't like him after that. From then on, uh, they tried to make things difficult for him. And he said that's basically what got him in jail. Like they framed him and uh, yeah. So it's a crazy story, bro. It's like a, it is a movie basically. Oh, it's, 
It's a crazy story. Bad. Like, like what I've said does not do it justice. He gives mad yeah. details. He goes into all. Oh, but that what the reason I was bringing this up is for strategic thinking because he said that I they taught me how to think and how to strategically think things out. So I knew what they were using against me, and so yeah. I had to kind of use it against them as well. I had to play the game. So, for example, when they were in court. Um, he said, I knew that if I went all out and I exposed all the secrets, then I wouldn't have any, there would be no win-win for them because they'd lost everything. They have no incentive to help him out, right? They've got nothing to lose if he, if he exposed everything. So he only yeah. said little hints of things to threaten that I can say more. And, and that's where, the way that he got a bit that of leverage, leverage and this and that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, crazy, man. Makes me want to read the, that book as well, though. Uh, stuff like 48 laws of sure. power and stuff oh yeah stuff like that puts things into perspective a lot you know you can get caught up in all of your problems and then you realize well man there's people going through so so much deeper stuff out there oh that, man. Um, yeah Trust you me. know what i mean like yeah. and sometimes like i mean i often get very uh drowned in the stuff i'm dealing with and, and then yeah it does often pop, put things into perspective when you yeah. just think well this is your test look at other people yeah. and what they have to go through it sort of thing. also made me think like the, the man you become, let's say before the age of 30, I don't know how much changing you can do to that man afterwards, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's only a very small percentage of people who can radically change how they are. And I was just thinking about Toba, he was in the Marines from age 17. So imagine how tough he, he just is, right? So three years in solitary confinement, obviously it's something that most people kind of go crazy from, but he mostly, for the most part, he held on. And maybe that's, that's from this, this life he's lived, you know? And yeah. so, yeah, Allah doesn't give you something you can't handle. So because he went through that, went from a young age, he was in that mad training. What that means yeah. is that he could go to Mauritania and study for years in the middle of the desert with sandstorms, this, this, this. He said, when we moved from Mauritania to Egypt, he said the difference was so stark that he said my kids thought the escalator was like a uh you know what they called a funfair ride you know like this is how mad the technology was to them yeah, like yeah, a, yeah. A, a toilet like an actual toilet was crazy to them they, they thought he said they it looked like a mouth of a gin to them <laughs> so they, they're scared of the toilet because yeah. obviously they're probably just using like a hole in the ground in, in martania so that's that's hardcore stuff but made me kind of think of doing something radical um, before I turn 30, you know, to try and like, you know, become a bit more resilient. <laughs> yeah. Like, be like go through some kind of mad coaching program or something. Yeah. It's interesting to me because I think a lot about the threshold of people and like, you know, but other nafus experiencing their different struggles at the same level so for example mm. let's compare me and you hypothetically speaking let's say that you can handle more than me right but like you're 90 percent of a test and my 90 percent of the test even though if we compared them to each other they may be like mine might be a lot easier to deal with at face value will we both uh find it equally as hard will it put as much stress and emotional uh tension upon us do you understand what i'm trying to say like equally um that's something i've always thought about because some stuff like i deal with that i feel like it's just just driving me crazy but i don't know you know we need to have sabr and things like that but it, it really consume me and i think well let's take that abu toba example yeah at the height of his sort of stresses was he was he experiencing that emotionally and physically the same level i would experience something uh, that I considered really testing for me. And is that why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us differently? Because he knows what our thresholds are individually. Exactly. It's very deep. It's not, like, there's, there's no like answer your, for the question. Your 90% is probably his 40%, you know, and same yeah. here. Um, maybe yeah. even less so for me. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, he's, that's what I'm saying. Like some people are tougher because they, like, like I said, up till age, maybe even 30 is a bit late. Like up until age 20, 22, if you've like been through hard times or struggles or um, challenges, etc., you've had to learn to be resilient by that age. Okay, it's kind of ingrained in you. After that, I think it's, it's difficult, man. It depends though, because... 
there are a lot of experience. It depends what the, what the tests are because there are a lot of experiences you can put yourself through that can really transform what you can then be exposed to further, like what you can be desensitized to. Um, yeah, I, I mean, so. for example, some people some people have never seen, you know, uh, some people have never experienced death in person. Like they've never seen people die in front of them, or never seen dead, you know bodies or whatever it is i mean yes you can watch anything nowadays on the internet however to be there and see it and experience it and the smell and the, you know and i remember you know the first time for me it was quite it wasn't as much as it was difficult it was just very like thought-provoking you know i was thinking about it a lot mm, yeah now it's quite now it's quite frequent but relatively speaking it's quite frequent but still like um, you don't want to I think the trap is you don't want to belittle anything that can happen to you uh, you need to be, put yourself in a position where you can thank Allah for every test no matter how minor or major it is because I think what I'm trying to do is appreciate the strength that Allah may have given me that I know that there's things that I do you know every week every month whatever it is or things that come confront me that I consider quite minuscule and it's fine I can get over that or I can deal with that now, other people haven't got the strength or haven't been blessed with the strength to deal with that you know um so little things can be it can be something as small as somebody's opinion like you can have you can hear somebody's opinion negative opinion and for some people that can absolutely destroy them it really can like some people are so focused on people's perceptions of them or hearing something bad or whatever that that's it that's all they can think about it's what they can talk about they just want to please people and that can actually really ravage somebody's mind. Um, so you have to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the, 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 the strength that you have. And sometimes just take a step back and think these tests, these tests are here for a reason, you know, um, they're, they're there to shape you. They're there to, 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 they're not even there for you now. They're there for you later, you know, because there's things that you can look back on and think, if I, it wasn't for that test that I wouldn't have grown into this and I wouldn't have gone here and I would have done that. And, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I don't I don't wish hardship on myself, but the truth is that the hardship that obviously you don't ask for can be the most transformative, you know. Hmm. So I don't know. We just ask Allah for what's good, man. It's too difficult because it's you're it's almost like you're stuck between a rock and a hard place with it. For example, you don't want to be tested to the, I mean, nobody, nobody wants to be tested, right? But at the same time, if you're not tested, then you're worried that. Yes. Because of, you understand, you're worried that. Is oh, it because oh, Allah left you to do, yeah, keep doing your own same thing? Exactly. Yeah. So it's a bit yeah. of this sort of like rock and a hard place with it. And mm. No, I ultimate. think, I think I'm being, I'm being tested for example, let's, I'm being tested not in any obvious way, if you know what I mean. Like, right. I don't have a dying, uh, I don't know, uncle who I'm very close to, whatever, you know. I don't have yeah. that thing, but it doesn't mean I'm not being tested. But for me, I feel like my test is my weakness. Right. You, you get it. I'm, I, mm. When I look at someone like Abu Toba, when I look at people uh, one generation before me, when I look at people... 10 generations before me, all I see is weakness in myself. You know, the fact that yeah. I can't, you know, the fact that I use my phone, whatever hours a day without necessarily having a clear intention of, okay, I'm going to unlock my phone out to do this. Like that is weak. You know, the fact that I can't concentrate deeply on work for more than like one hour at a time, that is weak. Like I, this is the thing which that worries me, you know, because I feel like, uh, at any point I might need these weaknesses might need, might be more essential areas than now. Right. So now, um, you know, the fact that I can't, the fact that I don't know how to, uh, I don't know, let's go with the concentration thing. The fact that I don't, uh, I can't concentrate for more than an hour at a time, for example, that's not such a big deal. Like I'll just make it up by doing like pure hours or whatever. Like I, I don't even have like a boss, you know, over yeah. my shoulder asking me, what have you done and stuff anyway. I, alhamdulillah, I hold myself accountable. But at any given time, you never know where you might need that concentration, right? You mm. might need that perseverance to do something difficult, right? Mm. So 
that's kind of what worries me. And it also makes me feel like I'm more of a burden on the ummah than a benefit. And that's like the worst thing, man, because when you see the, the ummah is in a bad situation, you're like, okay, you know, let, what can I do to get, get, you know, get the ummah out of it? But, yeah. but then you realize, damn, like, forget helping those people. I'm the burden <laughs> on yeah. the ummah. Yeah. So. I've always feel like you, you're, you, you have a very outward look in terms of your, you hold yourself accountable for quite deeply for what the ummah is sort of dealing with at large. And I struggle to do that. Otherwise, I'd just get completely overwhelmed by it. Although I hold, my, I hold myself accountable on a more of a like a butterfly effect scale, you know. So I consider like small changes will have a butterfly effect on the ummah as opposed to me looking at the ummah yeah. and thinking by that. You know what I'm saying? I agree with that. And I think that's yeah. the harder thing to do. The harder yeah. thing to do is the less gl uh, glorified thing, right? Mm. So... You know, I don't know about you or the listeners, how they grew up, but I grew up uh, hearing about Palestine. And it's always yeah. the question, okay, who's going to liberate Palestine? And these kind of things, you know, Kashmir and this and that you, you hear about. And you start saying like, okay, like my purpose in life, like since, alhamdulillah, I grew up with uh, education and food and stuff like that. Well, now I've got to do something bigger than that, right? I've got to contribute right. to something rather than just filling my own belly and stuff, right? So that's why I'm, that's where maybe I get the perspective from where it's like, okay, your basic thing, just assume that's done. Like now, what are you going to do further? But I actually yeah. think that you can get that wrong, right? You can get that wrong because then sometimes you go, oh, I'm going to become a, a Islamic YouTuber, right? I'm going to get into some of right. the troubles that come with that when you go and make videos when you're not ready for it or whatever. Or it might become, I'm going to become a Nasheed superstar because that's like really good for the Ummah, right? right. Um, and so by focusing too much on helping others, you actually flop yourself. So I think what yeah. your, your focus on, you know, that little change within yourself that will have a, an effect, that is maybe what should be the first thing we think of, isn't it? It may be a shift, bro, because I don't think I've thought like this. I think I used to hold, I used to be a bit more, you know, wide, wider thinking, right? And I think the bigger my responsibilities at home got, now that I've got two kids, you know, been married for, alhamdulillah, four or five years, whatever. And um, it's now like the whole perspective shift has just zoomed in right on what I've got here. Yes. You know, and I think that happens to a lot of people anyway, because uh, somebody messaged me yesterday, actually, a brother that I usually used to speak, I used to speak to years ago on social media. He messaged me, he's like, oh, um, you know, I haven't heard of you. I haven't heard from you in a while. And you're not as outspoken on social media, whatever. And he, and he was just checking in on me. And it actually made me think, I thought, well, I don't have the, that drive anymore to make some big sort of, mm. like put myself in a firing line or, do you understand? Like risk yeah. it all or whatever. Um, you know, take someone like, um, I don't know, take someone like Mohammed Hijab, right? You know, I, I think he's a good brother. I think he's, he puts himself out there, you know, quite, um, not controversially, but like up against, you know, ex-Muslims, up against the atheists, yeah. up against these fan bases as well. Up that, against uh, the weak you know, ones, untrained yeah. ones. <laughs> 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 but you know what I mean? Like, so like that's a mission that he's got. And I'm, I think he's got, you know, he may have kids, he may have family and stuff, but he, regardless, he's still got that on my wide mission, you know? I don't know if my family could handle me putting myself through something like that. Um, uh -huh. You know, setting upon some sort of grand sort of task to really put put myself and possibly them in the firing line of all sorts of, of stuff, you know? But it yeah, does yeah. take people with that mindset to do so. However, I don't think that just because I'm not doing that, that the work I do is invaluable is not valuable you know i think everybody needs to pick what they think they can excel in and, and aim for that you know yeah i think bro yeah. like 99 percent of people it would be wrong for them to try and put themselves in the muhammad hijab position right yeah like that's that's what as far as i'm concerned what we should be running away from I'm not saying he, he's wrong for doing what he's doing. But I'm no. saying for 99% of us, we should be running away from anything which is public, very public, right? Mm -hmm. So at most, what you might be doing is that you're public in your local masjid or your local community, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? That's as public as you might want to go, right? Um, 
and yeah, and there are some, I guess, there are some uh, exceptions to that. W whatever, I'll get into that. But I just think, like when we talked about this many episodes, is that it's all about working on yourself and then working on your kind of local area. And that's like mm. not fancy, not glorified. You're not going to get, uh, you know, all these, uh, you know, whatever, shuch, like talking about you and, oh, yeah, great work and all that. You're not going to get that. But that's the reality of, of good work, right? Mm. Um, I was listening to Islam Turning on Sea podcast uh, with Sheikh Adil Salahi, who wrote, um, he translated uh, Sayyid Qutb's uh, translate, uh, tafsir of the Quran. And he was saying that Sayyid Qutb was like, although people see him as like uh, someone who's outspoken against uh, oppression and stuff like that, but really his whole thing was just terbiyah, just like fix yourself. And right. that's not fancy. That's not attractive, especially these days where you can easily broadcast what you're doing. But, uh, mm. but ultimately, I, that's, what, that's what I think, bro. I think like doing the, picking up the litter in the street is, is what we should be doing <laughs> rather than uh, posting whatever online. Yeah, stuff like that, bro. Even low levels, like people, you just, you have to consciously think of it like, points bro you're scoring points if you know what i mean like yeah little things can actually have such mm. huge weights in you know in the sight of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have you um did you manage to catch that uh khaled green did a uh sort of i suppose it's a podcast really with with uh, dr tahir wyatt and uh mufti did you see that did you send it to me i may have done i'm not sure yeah anyway i, I opened it people. and i i had it there to watch and then now i haven't watched it but i want yeah, to watch it, it. He's, he speaks. He, he speaks a lot. A lot of it is about <clears throat> sort of like uh, you know this sort of hulu and this hezbiya that exists in certain circles and how um, how I, I just like basically it kind of reminded me of what you said about the whole local versus global thing um, mm. because I think what we fall into we see all this shuyuk online and we think that their work is online. And that's yeah. what they 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 exist mm. for. They mm. exist for, on, and then we judge them based on what they do, where they're positioning themselves purely from an online lens, mm. not realizing that actually the real work is the communities they serve. Yes. You know, the videos they do it's probably like five ten percent of what they do. Yeah, back, so yeah. Do you understand? Like exactly. the real yeah. work they do is imams in their communities. Yeah, and yeah. they are serving their communities and the message that they're you know, yeah, you know, affiliated with etc. And then it. And, you know, he was saying, like, especially, like, especially, so <clears throat> you've got these shiur, for example, in America, and then we're judging them by UK standards and UK demographics and UK sort of issues. And not only have we got all of that, but we're also importing these, these, um, not scandals, but like these, these problems from, from elsewhere, from the Arab world that they're dealing with between, you know, let's say students of knowledge in, I don't know, Medina or, or Egypt or whatever. And they've got certain disagreements or differences of opinion that they're arguing with. And then we just import it here, even though it doesn't relate to anything that we're actively dealing with here, you know? Yes. Um, yeah, it's it's this local versus global thing, this this facade of the online world that makes you think that you're doing something when you're not really actually doing anything. Yeah. You know, yeah. Your, the impact that you have is very slim on online. Everybody wants to like, you know, make a reminders account and, yeah, tweet yeah. A reminder and yeah. Do you understand? I'm not saying that's bad. I mean, even us with our bad, podcast, actually. isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not saying that's bad. I think you know, for for this podcast, my biggest takeaway from it is actually like it's not like we can see the audience we're speaking to. You know, what I'm saying like it's not like we've got like a live chat going on and we can see and whatever. Like for me, this is like my weekly opportunity to speak to someone. You know, and I don't know, you know maybe you feel the same way. But I, I speak to you. A week we collect our ideas and we 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 you know depart and to me i think you know this is like one of those things where you meet for the sake of allah and you depart for the sake of allah you know even though we're not physically meeting but it's not like we're coming on here talking about the stock market every week or something like that <laughs> you know what i mean like we're we're, we're trying to sort of benefit each other and benefit those who bother listening so yeah yeah there could be there could be things but a lot of a lot of it is kalam, basically what I'm trying to say. And you can't count, you can't bank on kalam. You can't bank on it in terms of your akhira. You mm. can't bank on just saying good things. Mm -hmm. It's the doing things that yeah. you can bank on. It's the the good deeds that you can physically do that you can say, okay, at least that way, 
especially the ones that are sincere that nobody knows of, you know, then you can think, okay, at least that way I've tangibly done something that I can see with my eyes and Allah knows best. You know? Yeah. And although I know a lot, I think I, t I mentioned this before, I think a lot of the rhetoric, especially before was about how you can have the dunya and the akhirah, how you can um, basically live your life with the objective of having the best dunya possible and still go jannah. And that's not yeah. incorrect, right? Yeah. In a way, in a way. Although the Prophet ﷺ says, <laughs> like whatever you aim for, that's what you'll get, right? So if you did the uh, hijrah, you migrated somewhere to, to get married, then you went to get married. You didn't do it for the sake of Allah. So just be honest with yourself, right? But anyway, yeah. um, basically what I'm trying to say is that for me at least, I like to feel like I'm sacrificing something. Like, what am I doing? Okay, I'm doing a podcast. Inshallah, I will benefit some people somehow by exposing them maybe to an idea that they didn't have, something like that, right? Yeah. I'm writing a book because I'm like researching how men should be according to what Allah's given us in terms of guidance, everything. And inshallah, that will help men, you know, stop their negative traits and, and become more useful, right? There's all these good intentions, right? But for example, with the podcast, I don't find it difficult. I, I don't feel like I'm sacrificing, okay? Mm. The time that I give this, it doesn't feel like a sacrifice. The money I give, it doesn't feel like a sacrifice. So, alhamdulillah, it could benefit. I'm not saying that. Like, I ask Allah to make it in our scales, uh, heavy in our scales, right? However, I wouldn't consider this bread and butter. I wouldn't consider this like, yeah, yeah. maybe this could be the gate through which I enter Jannah. You know, I, I just yeah. personally, I can't see it that way. But the book, like the book is hard. Yeah. So maybe yeah. the book could be uh, something like that. Or yeah. memorizing the Quran, like that is, that is difficult, man. And yeah. memorizing the Quran is something that I don't know if it's become a trend right now, but um, it's usually in private, you know, completely in private. So you're, when you're memorizing the Quran, the, most of the benefit you're getting is a little bit of momentum and progress that you feel you're making maybe and yeah. the edger from Allah inshallah right that's it yeah. like you're not getting praise you're not getting views you're not getting uh, positive feedback so you know we need to do more of those things and I feel like I always need something like that you know like when you're fasting you might struggle like outside of Ramadan you're the only one in your household fasting you're the only one in your uni class in your workplace fasting it's difficult yeah. the days are long or whatever it is that's something like I feel like we always need some things of substance um, mm. to really I, I, I kind of take it from that book uh, skin in the game by is it Nicholas Taleb bad book by the way don't read it <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the guy hates Islam he's like Lebanese Christian he hates Muslim anyway oh, no. um, but one thing I got from it is just this concept that you got to have skin in the game like you got to give something up if you if you if you're gonna actually achieve something in the domain that you, you're going after then go into the domain sacrifice something in domain go into the trenches get at least get your boots muddy like okay you don't have mm. to go up to your chin in mud but get you know so yeah. that's what i i question myself sometimes about those things in terms of um going out doing public things because of the isolated life i live in terms of i don't have a, you know a local masjid that i can clean the toilets of right? i don't really have that so that's why I guess I go a lot online, but I need to make sure I'm doing something where I'm sacrificing. You know? I think it's just, I think our sense of value has just been warped, isn't it? Because we just, we just think everything, all the good has to be online and not just that some, some of it has to be sort of shown online. Like, Oh, look, like you get some of it where it's like, Oh, I'm doing good. Come on, everybody join me to do good. And it's like, well, I wouldn't really want to, I don't want that risk. I mean, I don't want to put that deed of mine at risk by calling other people to, oh. to join me to do it, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Like, it's just too, it's just too fragile. Mm -hmm. Like, the, but there, there's a lot of opportunity, bro. Like, you can just, you're, you've got opportunities daily, honestly. There's daily opportunities that nobody needs to know about that arise even as, you know, you walk from here to flipping, I don't know, the, the corner shop and there's opportunities to do anything. It could be something as small as like, I don't know, moving a snail from a, mm. from the path so it doesn't get crushed to voice you know, noting your being mom. Polite to someone. Huh? Voice noting someone, yeah. Your mum, yeah. 
that we said. Oh, my mum, I thought you said someone. Yeah. Yeah, anything like that, anything. Especially if you consciously think, oh, let, let me think. Bro, I think there should be like, I bet you there is ways of doing it. Maybe there's an app for it. There should be like a reminders app or something like that where, you know, you can just sort of get those nudges. I'm sure I had something like that before. It would like send me nudges to do something good or, you know. I'm sure I had something like that, subhanAllah. Taqwa nudge. But yeah. Taqwa no? nudge.com. Taqwa nudge. There you go. We're just giving out ideas, bro. We're like a think tank. <laughs> we, you're going to pay us for our services, bro. You're going to have some like super super startups coming out from Mind Heist. <laughs> all we're going to get is a little uh, a special thanks to Mind Heist in the credits. That's mm. what it's going to be. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think... You know, if you think about it, yeah, to get specific, like imagine, let's say, imagine you're doing a YouTube channel, something, you know, trying to do something of use to people. Like you're actually doing it with the hope that Allah will reward you for it, right? Yeah. Now, that might be fine. Obviously, you do have to question like, what am I doing differently? Why am I doing all of that? Whatever, okay. But now you're doing something public. And so you just have to at least match it with something private. That's what I think. Or probably more than that. Like, so let's say, you're spending five hours a week um, on the public thing, like spend 10 hours a week on the private thing. You know what I mean? Like it should yeah. be, should have that kind of, some kind of balance in there. So, yeah. um, so for us, it's like doing the podcast, like we should be doing double this amount of Quran, reading Quran, memorizing, whatever, you know, you know what I mean? Like have that private public thing, you know? And yeah. I know scholars have talked about this. I just, I can't quote them, so I, I won't. <laughs> mm. I feel like you're something, I don't know. Obviously, I wouldn't know what people go through. However, there are certain, there are certain things I try and put at the forefront of everything. And for example, my biggest thing is my connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And that isn't just about prayer and that isn't just about doing you know my obligatory things and, and my extra things it's about actually having that conversation constantly it's about the struggles that you go through daily you know and the things that you want to achieve and the the things that uh, worry you keep you up at night those are the things that you talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about through dua through just Honestly, just almost not, not, I don't want to say talking to yourself because you're not talking to yourself, you're talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's being conscious that Allah knows what you're going through, and you can talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about these issues in private. In you know, whether you're you know, you've got time to yourself, you're walking somewhere, you're driving somewhere, whatever it is, and that's what's most valuable to me is just keeping that going, um, to, to, to have that conversation all the time, which increases your consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala watching everything you do which then makes this little things so valuable to you you know mm. so sometimes like i don't know if like people can establish that i don't know if people think of it the way i do you can't tell what people think but there have been times where i've got the vibe that some people have found doing that quite difficult like i can't remember who said it to me i can't remember who said it to me because i gave them that as advice just to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about their problems at any opportunity anytime you're alone you're not alone like anytime you're going somewhere you're on your own you you think you know you're on your own quote unquote you're not you know and that is an opportunity for you to speak to to, to your lord someone i can't remember who it was but they told me oh i just find it really difficult it, it feels silly i think they said it feels silly to do that i think they were just newly practicing or whatever and that's what's important it's once you once you can nail that and you realize that you're never alone, you know. You're always being supported, backed up, observed, um, that kind of thing. You're always being protected. You're always being guided. You can always ask Allah for guidance. Um, any action you do, anything you're not sure about, you just keep asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance and talking through the problem with a love conscious, you know, and aware of you doing so. You understand what I mean? Mm. So you're not in this vacuum on your own where you're just sort of trying to find your way blind you're there being observed i think that's what has to be internalized um and that way ultimately yeah like i was saying the smallest of deeds become really valuable because you know the importance of it because you've instilled this sort of you know taqwa you've instilled this sort of element that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is observing you know when you yeah. when you say speaking to allah you mean like <laughs> do you mean like dua or like what 
a bit of both. So my understanding of dua isn't just me asking Allah for things, yeah. you know, although that is the majority of what it is. However, it's also like, like I don't feel any shame in just, for example, like my most often where I'm on my own is when I'm driving to or from work, right? And it's what, 10, 15 minutes. And, you know, and the work can sometimes give me a lot of anxiety, especially like before I start work, probably the highest level of anxiety is just that build up, right? Because you're it's like coming up to the unknown of it. And that is like, where I speak to Allah the most and I, you know, I'll ask Allah to make this, you know, this day easy. And then I'll, I'll be thinking about what I want to achieve and where I want to be in the next five years and stuff. And I'll speak mm. to Allah about that. I'll just, it's almost like if you were to observe me, you'd probably think I'm speaking to myself, but I know I'm going to speak to myself, you know, and it actually is, it's, it's, you know, it's through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the, 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 that form of expression, because they say talk to people, don't they? They say talk to people to relieve your sort of stress and mm. that kind of thing. Well, I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is listening to me. So all I need to do is speak. You know, that's all I need to do. In the same way that, you know, Ibrahim, Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he was searching the, searching the, you know, searching for who his Lord was, you know, he looked at the stars, he thought that was his Lord, and then the stars disappeared. These are things like you have it in the Quran. You see prophets that are speaking to Allah, but it's not, the way that we read the read the, the way that we read the story is not like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was directly replying back or it was because they were conscious of Allah, you know. Mm. They were conscious of Allah being being you know listening to them, etc. So when you've got ayat in the Quran of these prophets mm. that are speaking, almost like they're just speaking to themselves, no, they actually communicate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they they are taking their troubles to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. They they They've instilled this awareness, you know, mm. because it's not that every single time a prophet calls out to Allah, that Allah immediately responded with either an ayah or a, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Um, yeah. So, so this is it. It's about knowing that you're always, you know, you always have this quote unquote companion, you know, you've always mm. got, you know, Allah observant of you, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. It's not like you're, you're just left to your own wits and your own, you know, yeah, your own, actually, uh, uh, you're right. Like I can, I can think of a few examples where there is a du'a in it, but there's a lot of extra information that the prophet or the messenger is is actually saying. So I, mm. I thought of this ayah. قَالَتْ إِمْرَأَةُ إِمْرَانَ رَبِّ إِنِّي نَذَرْتُ لَكَ مَا فِي بَطْنِي مُحَرَّرًا فَتَقَبَّلْ مِنِّي إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ. So mm. in this whole thing that she said. Only two words, if you like. I don't know if that's two words, three words. فَتَقَبَّلْ مِنِّي That's the only bit that's actually du'a, is yeah, actually asking. Yeah. But she's adding the extra detail of إِنِّي نَظَرْتُ لَكَ مَا فِي بَطْنِي مُحَرَّرًا So that's what, kind of what you're saying in a way. It's like adding that extra detail. And it's, it's almost like, I guess, complaining. Just like... Uh, mm. uh, uh, what's Yusuf's father? Yaqub, like Yaqub, he said, he said, "Innama ashku bethni bethi wa huzni ila Allah." Right? So I only uh, complain to Allah, basically. And so mm. complaining to Allah, I don't know if you call that du'a, but it is is basically what you're talking about, isn't it? And we got some it's, examples, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, uh, every time I read the Quran, I just I see it again and again. I see the prophets are constantly communicating with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Mm. Um, and that's not just through like that like that example was like a promise made to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like yeah Allah I promise that this child of, of mine etc like that's you're not asking Allah in fact, in fact you're you know promising you're, to Allah, yeah. you're promising something and it's, yeah. it's another you know it's just mm. another thing so mm. I just find it easier to be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if I've constantly mm. got that communication link going you know and it's not just exclusively for salat because mm. I can't, you're not always going to be able to pray. In the sense, of course, you can pray your father, but I'm saying it's not like, oh, I want to have a connection with Allah, I'm going to pray now. You know, mm. it's about constantly just having that conversation flow. Yeah, I think that's that way you've got, part of taqwa, isn't it? Probably. Mm. You know, I'm not trying to say that I'm a muttaqi and I've got it, you know, I've got it down and I've got it. You know, the, thing that, the things that distract me the most are other people. And ultimately, I think that's the same. The moment I'm on my own is the moment I realize Allah is observant on me. As soon as I'm in a room full of other people, uh, you know, 
or people that are actually trying to engage with me because I can be in a room full of colleagues, but I'll be on my, like, I'll just be quiet. I won't be talking to anybody. I'll just be thinking about whatever I was thinking about, you know, mm-hmm. but actually in the moment you're in a group or you're in an arena where you're engaged with other people in conversation or whatever, where is Allah in that conversation? Unless you are talking about Allah in mm-hmm. that, or talk about the Dean within that conversation, you know? And then I just think, Oh, that's when I start thinking, Oh, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have said that. Or, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Like, oh, I should, and then you like stuff for stuff from. It's not. It can't be anything bad. It could just be like, you know, maybe maybe you've been joking too much, or maybe you know a joke went too far, or do you understand what I mean? Like, uh, just topics or areas of conversation. But the moment you're on, you're on your own, you're not making those jokes because you're you're with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala in that sense. Your mm. your solitude is, and this is probably why, like, you know, people, you know, I don't know if it's it could be just men in general, like men like to deal with their problems on their own they like to have a certain element of solitude you know the prophet sallam went up to the cave of hira because he seeked solitude because he had questions about life in general and he was searching for something you know ibrahim alayhi salam it seems and it appears based on the stories in the quran that he spent a lot of time in solitude especially the early years when he was just like when he's thinking about who his lord was when he went into the the the, the went and destroyed the idols like these are things he's just thinking about on his own but that solitude has an element of we know that allah was observing him because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the quran what the story was mm. like that's what's so powerful to me like mm. these prophets were doing these things and thinking these things and saying these things right and at that time it's just like now like i could be on my own speaking and whatever but then allah has proved and established that he was there obviously he was there but like given us the evidence in the Quran that yes, I know every single word that Ibrahim said. I know every single word that the Prophet mm. said or felt or thought or whatever. And here's the proof because I'm telling you the Ummah, I'm telling the Muslims now what, what it was. I just find mm. that so powerful, bro. Because that revelation, the revelation of this the ayat that we have in the Quran, is gonna be the same sort of feeling when on the Umul Qiyamah, when we have the revelation of this is what you did, this is what you thought, this is what you felt. Do you understand? This mm. is what you said. This is what the worries were. This is what, and Allah subhanahu wa taala is going to show us that He was aware of every single um, thing that we felt, let alone thought, let alone did. You know, so yeah, I find that powerful, bro. And I, mm. I don't want to, I don't want to sort of um, underestimate any moment, small or large. You know, that you don't want any sort of even little thing that. You speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you make dua for, just give it that value, give it that importance, because it will be revealed. It allows you to, to lessen the value that, or the impact that other people have on you. If somebody says something awful to you, right, and I've had this as like a motto from, from day one, if somebody like abuses me verbally or you know or insults me whatever i have it in my head that i will remember like i say okay just remember their face because you almost dm it it'll be recompensed you know that's all i need i don't need my own back now i don't need to start a fight with anybody i'm not you know don't mm. i don't want to create no commotion no altercations all i need is my my sabr and the sabr that i have it comes from that sort of element of you know, Allah is observant of me and this individual. Allah is observant of what's just happened and I'll get my rights back and that's it. You know, I don't need nothing from you right now. That's not valuable to me right now. But what's valuable is your smirk and your your haughtiness is going to come right back at you, Yom Al-Qiyamah, because that's what I'm waiting for. I'm not waiting for this. You know? mm. But there's, there's, there's people now that are hot-headed and don't have that because they're thinking about their haq now. They're thinking about it now. This is what they want. That's why fights happen. That's why altercations mm. happen. And You know? Mm, they want to play on instead of taking the free throw. Yeah, bro. <laughs> Trust <laughs> me. But one thing that I was thinking of when you were saying, you know, about like thinking about oh, how you spoke to that person or, you know, just that contemplation, it's impossible if you never have that kind of time, right? Mm-hmm. I was thinking about the Prophet then went to the cave and, you know, he didn't have, you know, his iPhone 11 with him, did he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and Ibrahim, when he was doing hijrah, when he was going to uh, Mecca, again, like he would have been, you know, just able to think and walk, right? Um, and Yusuf alayhi salam, when he was locked up, when he was in the well, when he was in these situations, he would be able to think. 
when Musa mm. salam, he was fleeing from Egypt and he went to Median, again, that journey was done alone. He was able to think. So we need to find some times to think. And I, I think what I started doing, I probably mentioned this on the podcast that I stopped, like I used to play on, on my way to the masjid every time I just play a podcast, even though it's a very short journey, three minute journey or something in the car. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I stopped that. I just thought, okay, this is some time where I can just like have nothing going on, no stimulation. But now I don't have that because the message is closed. So I, I also, I don't like drive to Dubai or Abu Dhabi or anything regularly anymore. So now I don't have that, you know, and that's not good. I think the sweetest place to do it is if you are in the message, you know, in a corner in the masjid on your own either waiting for salat or just after a salat or something like that whereas people aren't just necessarily come up to you and you know speak to you and distract you whatever that's the nicest place to do it because you feel like you've gone almost back to the source of the of the fountain so to speak like you you know you're as you're as, as close as you're going to get practically speaking um and obviously you've got that the, the even more sweeter than that is you know your your night prayers and that's, that's that's where you can really have your conversation that's when you can really you know if something means that much to you then that's what you're going to have to do for it sort of thing yeah. um but that connection actually like i, I you know I, I don't know if i should say I envy but i do envy that connection that the prophets had with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they they had the the evidences in front of them like to the point that they could see with their eyes you understand what i'm trying to say like so like the the miracles that they witnessed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending revelation through them, you know, that sort of thing. So it's powerful stuff, Akhi. It's powerful stuff. So just to get a percentage of that in my life where, okay, I want to be able to just constantly converse with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the same vein that I see that the prophets did in the Quran, then yeah, show me, show me aware, like <laughs> assign me to that. Like that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, but it's a goal of mine. It's a goal of mine to just be. Aware. It's the the next stage is to just be like. You see, some brothers got it where they're very aware of a lost panatala in conversation, no matter what they're speaking about, no matter what's going on. You know, I go, every few weeks, you know, I go and see a lot of Muslim brothers, and you know, we chat about all sorts of stuff. But then there's always a few brothers that are very. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always on their tongue, you know. Um, some brothers, actually, they just, you know how, uh, you know, you know those people that are just sort of, sometimes they just, they just break out into song every now and again. They just hum something, whistle something, or just mm -hmm. sing some sort of thing. There's brothers, actually, that I know, they just, they'll just randomly start reciting ayat to the Quran. You know, we could be talking, we'll be, you know, we'll be driving somewhere, and they, they'll just, you know, because they've been practicing a lot. And actually, it could be because they're thinking about something, and they've just started reciting. Bro, that's powerful, man. Like, I want to be like that. Like, I want there to be that connection all the time. You know, I want to be in a position where, like, my kids can ask me something and I've just got an air for them from the Quran because I, yeah. I'm so connected like that, that I can give them that example. The example is always there. Here. There's always examples in the Quran for any situation we're in. Um, so that's what I want to be able to do. And once again, that's sort of done through connections and establishing it and, basically you know swimming within that knowledge and the swimming within that experience you know mm. always letting it surround you but yeah, yeah man. <laughs> this is what the i can't remember man but it was a few years ago somebody i don't remember he told me about i think i don't know he's like a either this guy was a taxi driver or he was just taking someone somewhere as a favor i can't remember I think he's Martini and he memorized the Quran like so well that he's just driving like one, two hours drive and he's, he recites, I think it was like the whole Quran in that time. And you might think, how's that yeah. possible? But he knows it so well that he's just kind of doing it very, very fast. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Somebody who knows it that, that well, it, it does make you think like when Abu Toba was in solitary confinement, you think he had the Mus'haf, like they took the Mus'haf from him because they knew that, you know, he wanted it so much. So well, yeah. then what do you do? You know, this is what I was talking about earlier, like being weak. Like if you haven't memorized the Quran, at least, you know, you know, a few juz, five juz, six, you know, 
then you're kind of weak, man. It's like if you don't have the mushaf or the app on your phone, it's like you don't have the Quran with you, you know? Yeah. And, and, and yet then you have some people who not only is it in their mind memorized, but it comes to them in all these situations. And mm. that's really good, man. And, and also I was thinking when you talk about, <clears throat> you know, these kind of things we talk about, for example, pondering over the fact that, Oh, Ibrahim was was uh, was on his own, and Yusuf Aisyah was on his own. And these kind of ideas, my experience anyway, is that <clears throat> this was something I was kind of taught how to think in that way, taught a bit how to ponder, right? Yeah. I'm not saying that I'm the best at it, but I can see a difference between, like, you know, whatever eight years ago and now, right? And and I think <clears throat> a lot of it I no I noticed for sure came from uh, Norman Ali Khan. He's kind of teaching you how to ponder a bit, right? right? Like his videos, I don't know if they're really, you could take them as tafsir. It's more just pondering on things, right? And um, right. There's, a, there's a book that I got for Aid. It's, um, oh, it's actually here. It's called, it's called The Heart of the Quran. Commentary on Surah Yasin with diagrams and illustrations by uh, Sheikh Asim Khan. Yeah, nice cover, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, now this book is interesting books like a hybrid book you see it's like thin book okay how many pages is this it's like 100 pages but it's a lot of illustrations in it which means it's not like dense but it's kind of like a book of tafsir it's it's multiple tafsirs of surah yasin put right. together um in in a in a different way compared to like if you picked up an actual um mm. tafsir book right and even then like mm. many tafsir are, are not translated or whatever but this one is like more digestible and like reading something like something like this might train you on how to ponder you know mm. so i think pondering is a bit of a skill and you just get it by reading tafsir definitely and you know and listening to tafsir as well like people explaining you have many mm. i don't know about in english other than actually you have you have many people done tafsir in english actually in on youtube i'm talking about and then obviously you have people doing uh, Sharh of Hadith, which is similar. It's again, teaching you how to ponder on the Hadith and how to think of the context and all of these things in which the Hadith was said. And this is really mm -hmm. a useful yeah. skill for your, for your personal taqwa and your personal um, you know, pondering and, and, and softening your heart from those things, actually. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a mm -hmm. practical skill. More than, you know, many of us, subhanAllah, yani, many of us will debate amongst each other about, fiqhi issues you know oh i think i take this opinion because sheikh so-and-so said that and this hadith and that like we don't really know what we're talking about so that like getting good at reciting the different uh, rulings and stuff is not going to be as practically beneficial as this you know as an mm. actual skill because i mean that's a fake skill anyway like if you if you want to do fiqh like actually you have to go quite deep into it but this is something that everyone inshallah should do and can do yeah yeah, it's also like you don't want to, as there's, uh, I don't know how the best way to put this. It's like <clears throat> we have this thing where we ritualize our connection with Allah and we keep it exclusively for certain acts of yeah. better, such as praying. Like when you're praying, okay, that's Allah's time. When you're, you know, I don't know, other than praying, it's, it's hard to, to, to compartment. So, okay, when I'm reading the Quran, for example, this is the time I've set aside for Allah's yeah. time to add on my When you're doing Allah. dhikr, when you're this, Yeah, when you're dhikr, when you're this. So, it's about filling that gap. You know, you want to become someone who's conscious of Allah as much as possible all the time. So you've got to fill those gaps in a bit more. Like I said, that you don't want to be someone who, like, I think I wasted a lot of time spiritually by being around people too much when I was maybe a bit younger, you know, mm. or maybe when I started practicing, whatever. And because of that, you get involved in people's, like you've just given an example, you get involved in people's sort of uh, debates when it comes to the dean or debates when it comes to, you know, and I think I, at the highest point of my debating interest, you know, interested in this opinion versus that opinion, my iman was probably the lowest, you know, which is crazy, isn't it? But you think, oh, but you're talking about dean all the, the time. Well, actually, no, we're just arguing over who's right and who's wrong. And actually, the spiritual element of it is gone because the end goal has been missed completely. The reason why we should be arguing about these points, you know, uh, if we're going to argue about these differences of opinion is to achieve, you know, the, 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 
the rida of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over us. You know, that's what it should be. But it isn't. It gets about it's about I'm proving you right and I'm proving you wrong and all this other stuff. Um so yeah, also the end goal is always missed. You know, you sort of get lost in the source a bit. You've got to step back, separate yourself from people, take some time alone, man. Because I'm sure there's people that socialize way more than you know us and maybe don't have the opportunities as much sometimes it's such simple things that you can just have a straight conversation with Allah about like actually last night I came home from work at about midnight and you know I came into I came into my bedroom and my whole family were asleep here like so my wife and both of my kids because my son he's got his own room but he runs in here at night when he's a bit scared or whatever and sleeps here actually every all of them were asleep and I remember just standing here and I was just like Subhanallah, like I just had to have a conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about that blessing right in front of me, you know, to have my wife and kids like just all safe, secure, you know, waiting for me to come home and they're just sleeping like peacefully, do you know what I mean? And little things, actually, and you just think, I wasn't the one who kept them safe here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept them safe and I came home and they were still here and I leave and they're still, you know, these little things where we can't just, like I said, we don't want to under underestimate any sort of blessing that we've got or undermine any sort of blessing we've got we have to just constantly keep it going constantly keep that thank that shukr that conversation Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also you know there are inhibitors that we have to dua for example like sometimes you, when you have that what can happen is like you think that you're asking Allah for too much like some of my some of myself my doubt in myself is like I say oh like the Ibu Toba thing right we say, oh, subhanAllah, look what Ebu Toba went through. Who am I to ask anything? Do you understand what I mean? Like, I've mm. got so much. I'm blessed with so much. And I'm, I I complain and I make dua for extra things or things to be rectified. But look at what, what Ebu Toba went through. Or look what, you know, Brother Mahazam Beg went through. Or look what, you know, Tawqif Sharif at the moment is going through. And all these people that are like, that you're aware of, that you know that they're going through hardship. Who am I to ask for anything? But you have to sort of go past that. Like, I force myself to go past that and continue asking like through through my teeth because I feel guilty but at the same time I'm also in need and I'm always going to be in need you know of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, I don't know I don't know if you've ever felt like that do you feel like you you know who are you to ask Allah for anything when you've got so much already that was something I always sort of battled with but yeah sometimes yeah. I feel <clears throat> to be like a spoiled bra yeah um, that's but that's what I was talking about earlier like I, I feel in the middle in a way like, okay, the people I look up to and the people I respect, you know, mostly people older than me, uh, I see myself as much weaker than them, much mm. less able to be patient and persevere and mm. exert extreme effort, right? <clears throat> mm. um, but then I see also a lot of other people, either my age or younger, who, you know, the way they grew grown up is like if I'm 80% instant gratification, they're 95%, right? So yeah. I see them as well. So I guess I go between thinking, damn, you're a weakling to, well, at least you're not that level. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I go between yeah. those two. Yeah. And um, I guess I, I, maybe when it comes to asking for Allah, you know, things when you already have, it's just understanding maybe where I am. Like, like okay, I'm just, I'm just weak enough that, this is something I want and uh, I'm not yeah. comfortable without it. Just maybe, yeah. maybe that's even, maybe that's even what Allah wants from you to just humble yourself and be like, okay, this guy's asking for like a car with a nicer AC or whatever. Yeah. 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 Um, he's a weak slave of mine, you know, and he's humbling himself asking for something kind of uh, basic or uh, maybe, you know what I mean? So maybe that, that would actually be a, yeah, maybe that would actually yeah, yeah. be a good thing that you're kind of admitting that, Look, like I know it's a bit silly and that, but <laughs> I'm just yeah. weak. I'm just weak. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that's good, Akhi. Like, it's good to be able to rationalize it like that. That's the thing. You don't want to start, because really and truthfully, if we kept, if we kept that mindset up, we would never ask Allah for anything based on what we've got at the moment. Yeah. yeah. And Allah wants us to make dua, obviously. Uh, what's the ayah? Yeah, yeah. Inna al-mustakbirin. Allah talks about the people who don't make dua, that they're arrogant. Uh, mm. I need to find that in uh, most Are you fast on typing in Arabic at all? No, not at all. 
I usually use the um, voice thing. Voice. Oh, is it good? Text. Yeah, yeah. I, I do that all the time. If I need to write anything in Arabic, I'll just say it. And it will do text to speak. Especially if I want to write like a salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Where can I take me too long? Oh, you do it, that, bro. yeah? Yeah, bro. It just picks it up. Picks it up perfectly. So I've got the, um, you know, the auto correct thing. All right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Hmm. I'm where to an No, I didn't find it, bro. I didn't find it. But that's also a point uh, from a particular point of view. Like I've spoken to people that their barrier to to ask an Allah for anything is because they feel like if they ask Allah for something, it's like they've given up. So it's not actually coming from a positive place. It's coming from a negative place. There are people that aren't practicing that consider people who who do practice or who do. Uh, submit to Allah's decree and, and that sort of thing or ask Allah it's like they've given up the effort on the dunya and that's it now they're sort of like relinquishing it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when actually it should, that, that's the first thing you do you know mm -hmm. you submit to Allah and then you do the work it's not the other way around you don't do the work and then, then rely on Allah when it's all you know not yeah. going anywhere yeah. so that could be part of the, the arrogance when it comes to it yeah you, you know you were talking about maybe that's what you've done is you were saying before you, you were spending time with a lot of people and now you're spent, you got more chance to be alone. Mm -hmm. I, maybe I'm, I'm the opposite. Uh, no, I'm not the, so it, when I was in school, you know, plenty of people, whatever. Yeah. Then when I went uni, I was 50, 50. There was times when I was like fully alone and I, I enjoyed that, you know? Um, but I guess since uni, I've been alone, right? I've never, been living in a place where I'm like constantly meeting people except maybe for one year here or there. And now I'm like alone a lot. And I was listening to a podcast. I can't remember which one. And it made me think about, because when I think of improving myself, I think of, Oh, reading Quran more regularly or fasting more regularly or these kind of things. All right. But then I realized like I completely kind of forgot for, for many, many months I forgot like having any goals around improving my, just my character, like just like how generous I am or how, mm. um, how much I withhold my tongue from saying bad things about people mm. or these kind of things. And uh, I don't know how to kind of turn that into a habit, you know, like a habit could be reading Quran every day for five minutes, whatever. But these things, I don't know how to plan it in, but then I was thinking, well, damn, like, I don't have anyone to be more generous to <laughs> like, I, of course yeah. I've got the people I live with, but it's when you're so limited in your, especially face to face interactions, it really is difficult. And it, I guess another reminder that, you know, can't be living like this, man, like so isolated. Mm, possibly. Yeah. There's also like when you, one of the biggest transformations, obviously when you have kids and, and family and stuff like, especially with kids actually you can sometimes it feels like you're just looking at miracles every day like you can like one thing i like to do it's not necessarily i mean obviously i like to to play and engage with my son or whatever but i like to just observe him from a distance like doing mm -hmm. his own thing and i find that absolutely miraculous like how you know three years ago he just didn't even exist if you know what i mean mm. like now he is especially you know at this age he is now a child with a personality with likes and dislikes with, you know, you know, he's a soul. Like he just, there's a soul within him that is making decisions that is, and just observing that is absolutely miraculous to me. Like from a distance, you know, from a distance, just letting him sort of explore and, and do his own thing. Like I, I just loved, it's kind of like people watching, but because you're, you're observing the journey through your own eyes. Like these are years that you don't remember yourself going through mm. and you can't look at yourself doing. Mm. So when you, when you know from start to finish, it just puts life into perspective. It puts the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into perspective, you know, and it also, it gives you this sort of thing about ownership. Like the fact that he is a soul with his own opinions and his own thing, it actually detaches you as a parent a little bit because you realize that this is nothing to do with you. You know, mm -hmm. if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to take him, then it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's, you know, uh, you know, property. I know it's, and it's difficult for parents to swallow that. But actually, the more you observe a child and the miracle of it all, you just think, how, how much did I have in any of that? 
didn't really do much. And I'm, we're not doing much. I know it sounds, you know, for, for parents that exhaust themselves raising their kids, actually, a lot of it is sort of happening on its own in the sense that, you know, his ability to speak, his ability to think, his ability to decide, his ability to, you know, little things, I think, little things. It's just like, wow, these are powerful, powerful things. And it just, I think that's what it is. Like, you, I have that conversation with Allah while I'm observing my son, you know, even if it's mentally, like, even I'm not moving my lips, bro. I just think, wow, that's powerful. Um, and there's things like that. You've got to look for things like that. Actually. Little things like my drive to work is on top of the, um, the south coast have got all those white cliffs haven't they so i actually have to drive i mean i live on one of the cliffs really yeah, yeah. so mm-hmm. i have to drive along the cliffs to get there but when you know you get this like there's the, the the ocean right in front of me there's the seagulls flying across and i just look at those and i just look at the vastness of the ocean or look at the sky or look at always ayat bro and i just you've got to allow that stuff to penetrate your heart you really do because it's just don't i just i try not to undermine anything i try not to make anything sort of mundane or monotonous or like you know a daily occurrence um i try and focus on the details the small things i try not to that's why i don't think i'm too fussed about new experiences all the time i've never really had it in me that i'm like oh i need to do something new i need to go somewhere new i need to explore something new you know i think for, for a lot of people they focus on these big new experiences to really instill like some sort of big change within them but there's so many little things that if we just deeply focused on if we spent time deeply focusing on even small things um then you'd find it miraculous like i i know it sounds really crazy but like small cracks in a wall i find fascinating because like the detail of that crack yeah was 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 crafted by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the same way that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala crafted like the andromeda galaxy you know a bajillion miles away you know what I mean? Like the, oh. the detail there, the attention to detail on, you know, a crease on my clothing is the same attention to detail. You yeah. know, that and the fact that system. it didn't, yeah, even a crack in the wall, I guess I see it as, oh, you know, the wall is wearing away from the weather or whatever, but yeah. nothing happens without Allah's permission. Exactly. exactly. That's what, this is what I mean by attention to detail. It's yeah. not just the massive grand things that we think, subhanAllah, you know, Allah created this and Allah yeah. created that. No, it's yeah, about the small things. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's about yeah. comparing the huge things to the small things. Because mm-hmm. then you realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power mm-hmm. encompasses both the, the big and the small yeah. and everything in between, you know. Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. Damn. I, and I think that is, especially in these days, <clears throat> Yeah. The, the goal should be for a Muslim to not be on autopilot. You know, mm-hmm. to be aware of everything, and you know, fundamentally, that comes from in the malamalu bin niyat. If you need, if you want to get reward for everything, then you need mm-hmm. an intention for everything. And if you need to have an intention, you can't be on autopilot because autopilot mm-hmm. is without intention, mm-hmm. right? I'm driving to work because that's just what I do every morning, right? Whereas the Muslim should be like, I'm driving to work because X, Y, Z. I know that. This is encouraged. I know my aim is this. My long-term vision is this. That's why yep. today yep. I'm going to work for that thing 10 years in the future or in the akhirah mm. or whatever. And I'm driving to work. And because I'm not on autopilot and because I have an intention with why I'm going to work, I'm noticing the shapes of the clouds. I'm noticing the rays yeah. of the sun. Yeah, definitely. definitely. And, then I'm, and then I'm recognizing who put those there and then I'm praising him. Yeah. That's it, bro. That's exactly. We've just summed up exactly where this conversation is going. It's just those that thing. Don't don't <laughs> undermine it all. I mean, bro. I need to uh, start wrapping up now. I have to go at seven ish. You start wrapping up, and I'll stop wrapping up. Okay. Uh, I hope you, everybody's enjoyed this episode. Um, it was another wing it one, wasn't it? We didn't really have a topic, so we just sort of. I did, bro. I did. You had a topic. Oh, yeah. this was my topic. topic. Oh right, okay. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> That's good then. Good segue straight into it without even... Oh, so subtle, really. You're so subtle. I love it. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, if you would like to send us um, you know, emails, questions, that sort of thing, go to myhousepodcast.com, I believe. Yep. Uh, all the links are there. Um, if you are unaware, these episodes are being uploaded to the Sierra Masters YouTube channel where you can watch the video 
video um, version. Yeah. Version. Or leave, I, there's com- people leave comments on there as well. There's comments there. That's um, true. Yeah. yeah. I do check them occasionally. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram, I guess, Aki Tweet, and Twitter. Um, and um, you are, you sent out a recent email today, didn't you, about a, your launch grid thing? Yeah, yeah. I just thought I should I update really people. Yet. Yeah. So check your emails. I mean, as update with people regarding the book project, which it will go, we're going swimmingly. Um, inshallah. Trying to think of anything else? Anything else from you, I mean? No. Nope. No. Nope. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> well, um, everybody's goal for today it should be to focus on some small things, small details, you know, become a bit more observant and take some time alone. Yeah. You know? mm. Go to the park and just watch people. You know, just watch things. Just sit somewhere and watch things. Or if you're somebody that doesn't like that, go for a long drive, you know. Go for a long drive with nothing on. Mm. Like, not, not nothing on, like no clothes on. I mean, like, no podcast or radio yeah. or anything on. <laughs> That's yeah. what I meant. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, go for a long drive with, you know, no, no other sort of external um, sort of things. Mm. Anyway. I just realized, oh, bro, you know, in The Matrix. Yeah. Even in The Matrix, there's the concept of, Oh, all these people walking around and the birds and all that. It's all just a program running. Mm, mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Matrix has many parallels, Allah, to Islamic philosophy. But that's why they that's why they call it a system, bro. It's a system that just runs. It's like clockwork. Yeah, you know? but in that in their case, it's like a, an AI thing. Um, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Subhanakallah, Muhammad. Shadow and Ahlul Anta. Astaghfirullah. Wa Taala. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.